things, including our correction facilities. Our public health infrastructure from our hospitals to our state health response is quickly becoming overwhelmed. And from the start, I've made clear that in addition to saving lives, one of the main goals of our response is to protect our public health system and our hospitals from being overwhelmed. Let me explain this quickly. Whether you believe in the science of COVID or not, the reality is this, it's simple. COVID is filling up our hospital beds and that threatens all Nevadans. If hospital beds continue filling at this rate and staffing shortages continue to increase as they are now, that means all Nevadans will have limited access to the care they may need. It's not just for COVID. If you get in a car accident or have a heart attack or break a wrist, you won't be able to access care if our hospitals are full and there isn't enough staff. This is our biggest threat. You saw it in New York. You can see it now in El Paso. This cannot become our reality. There is a consensus on one inescapable conclusion. We are in a rapid trajectory that threatens to overwhelm our healthcare system, our frontline health workers, and your access to care. So it's time to act. From the start of the pandemic, there aren't any decisions that don't have negative consequences. Weighing the loss of jobs and businesses versus the loss of health and lives is painful without a perfect solution. While prioritizing the health and safety of Nevadans, I am also balancing the significant ramifications that further restrictions will have on our suffering economy. No state struggles with this more than Nevada due to the lack of diversity in our economy. I've mentioned this High Wire Act before, this Great Balancing Act, and it feels like we've been living in this no-win situation for nearly nine months now. And believe me, I understand the stress, emotionally, mentally, economically, that you are all going through. Today, I'm announcing new restrictions in an effort to get this wildfire under control. I am not issuing a shutdown order. Repeat that, I am not issuing a shutdown order. My goal is to aggressively try to attack this spread while maintaining some portion of our economy and our daily lives. That's why I'm announcing that effective Tuesday at 12.01 a.m., Nevada will be operating under a statewide pause with the following conditions in place. We will keep these restrictions in place for at least the next three weeks. At least the next three weeks. I'll talk more about the next step soon. First, I'm strengthening Nevada's mask mandate across the board. Nevadans and visitors are now required to wear a mask at all times when you are around someone who is not part of your immediate household, whether indoors or outdoors. This expansion includes requiring masks during private gatherings. I will talk more about private gatherings in a minute. In the last month or so, new research has emerged that continues to validate the importance of wearing a mask. They continue to be an essential tool in our fight. Going forward, we will reduce capacity in certain high-risk areas that have been shown nationally and in Nevada to contribute to the spread of COVID-19. Under the statewide pause, no additional businesses will be closed, but capacity limits and new mitigation measures will be imposed on both businesses and gatherings. I will start by explaining what's changing. Restaurants and bars, they are currently operating at 50% capacity. Under the statewide pause, they may continue to operate under strict social distancing requirements at 25% occupancy, indoor and outdoor. No more than four patrons per table and seating at bar or countertops must continue to be socially distanced under the existing guidelines. Restaurants and bars should continue to have hand sanitizer available and should be conducting health screenings and or temperature checks. For restaurants and bars that serve food, 
reservations are required. No walk-ins will be allowed. I know the majority of our bars and restaurants are doing their best, but these settings are proven to be high risk because they allow the opportunity for people to remove their face coverings in indoor settings around people outside of their households. That's how the virus spreads. That's why I encourage curbside delivery and or carryout operations and why our healthcare experts want to remind Nevadans and visitors that you must keep your mask on at all times when you are not actively eating or drinking. Regardless of whether you are six feet away from others or not, you must maintain your mask at all times when not actively drinking and eating. If you choose to dine indoors, keep your mask on as much as possible. I encourage restaurants and bars to try to expand outdoor seating options. And I encourage local governments to work with these businesses to meet this goal. Gyms, fitness and dance studios and places like martial arts studios currently are operating at 50% capacity. Under the pause, they may operate with no more than 25% occupancy under strict social distancing requirements. We are strengthening our mask mandate with no exceptions, no exceptions for indoor exercise. Masks must be worn at all times unless you are actively drinking. If the activity is too strenuous to be done while wearing a mask properly, you must seek an alternative exercise. Other businesses that will be moving from 50% to 25% capacity during the pause include the following. Museums, art galleries, libraries, zoos and aquariums, arcades, racetracks, bowling alleys, miniature golf, amusement and theme parks, and other similar activities. Additionally, gaming operations will be restricted to have no more than 25% occupancy and must operate pursuant to requirements issued by the Nevada Gaming Control Board including health and safety policies. Restaurants and bars with, within gaming establishments will be restricted to the 25% capacity under the statewide pause. Public gatherings. Recently, we took great steps to increase gathering size to 250 people or, 25, or 50%, whichever was less. Unfortunately, due to the surge we're experiencing, we must decrease these limits during the pause. Public gatherings will be limited to no more than 50 individuals or 25% of fire code capacity, whichever is less, under strict social distancing requirements. This includes places of worship, indoor movie theaters, live theater performances, casino showrooms, weddings, funerals, celebrations of life, milestone celebrations, and any other event where members of the public may be gathered together at the same time in the same place for the same purpose. No large gathering plans will be approved during this time. Again, all gatherings must be limited to 50 people or 25%, whichever is less. If larger events have been approved to take place in the next three week period, they must be canceled. Private gatherings. In addition to public gatherings, this statewide pause will also include new and necessary limitations on private social gatherings. We know a significant source of spread is right in our homes. And we must do all that we can to prevent it. Under the statewide pause, private gatherings will be restricted to 10 people or fewer from no more than two households, whether indoors or outdoors. 10 people or fewer from no more than two households. As I said before, face coverings will now be required in both public and private settings whenever you're with people outside of your household, even if you're socially distant. And while I beg all Nevadans to listen to our health experts and the CDC by spending only spending Thanksgiving with your household members. If you choose to gather with those you do not live with, you must all wear masks. 
Additionally, there will be a pause on adult and youth sports tournaments during this period, effective Tuesday morning. There will be a pause on all adult and youth sports tournaments. Retail establishments, including malls, will not have to change their capacity during the statewide pause and continue had, can continue operating at 50%. Retail, retail grocery stores uh, with over 50, retail and grocery stores with over 50,000 square foot capacity will now be required to have employees at all public entrances counting patrons to assure compliance with capacity limits. Again, I wanna strongly encourage and promote online ordering, curbside delivery, and or carry out options. As a reminder, every business venue and gathering space is required to post capacity limits under COVID-19 directives at all public entrances. You can find downloadable capacity signs on the NV Health Response website. Now what won't change under the statewide pause? Brothels, adult entertainment establishments, day clubs and nightclubs will remain closed. Again, retail establishments will not have to change their capacity limit of 50%, but some will have new mitigation requirements in place. Additionally, the following businesses continue, can continue operating under the current standards and will not have to adhere to new restrictions under the statewide pause. Hair salons, barbershops, nail salons, and businesses that provide aesthetic skin services. Spas, massage therapy, and massage establishments, body art or, bo or piercing establishments. Finally, community and recreational centers will continue to operate at 50% capacity, understanding that they provide critical childcare services during this time of need. I wanna be clear that the new public gathering limits do not apply to our school districts in Nevada. And I wanna take a few minutes to talk about schools now. The very first emergency directive I issued after declaring a state of emergency back in March was to temporarily close schools. At that time, none of us could have imagined that we would have some children in our state who had not set foot in a school building for more than eight months. Since I made the difficult decision to close schools, and their buildings, we have seen our infection rates and risk factors increase and decrease in response to actions taken. That includes actions that government has taken in regards to testing, to issuing stay at home orders, closures, and the gradual reopening of our economy. But it also includes actions that have taken as individuals in response to whether or not all of us are doing everything we can to keep our neighbors and our families safe whether we wear our masks and refrain from taking unnecessary risks. Let's be honest, our casinos, hotels, restaurants, and bars are open with strict restrictions so that we can protect our economy. Meanwhile, the majority of our school buildings across our state are closed and our kids are suffering as a result. Our education system and our economy are not mutually exclusive they are tied together. As long as school buildings are closed, our economy cannot be fully open. Mom and dad can't go to work if they have children learning from home who need supervision. We must reprioritize keeping our kids in the classroom or getting them there, or getting them there. Throughout this crisis, we have been talking about protecting our vulnerable populations. Well, children, are not as physically vulnerable to COVID-19 as elderly or medically at risk, that certainly doesn't mean they are immune to its effects. They too are vulnerable in this pandemic and they desperately need all of our support. As I said, we have students who have not been inside of a school building in over eight months. And while we're doing everything we can to provide community support for some children, that could mean that they have not had access to reliable food, to safe shelter, or to caring adults who can intervene immediately if something isn't right in over the last eight months. We've talked about wearing masks to protect our elderly, our parents, and our grandparents. 
and we've talked about staying home so we can keep our economy open. Today, I'm asking you not only to follow through with these tougher restrictions during the statewide pause for the vulnerable and our economy, but to do it because our children deserve our support. We have seen more deaths by suicide among students this fall than in years prior. And it breaks my heart to share that victims have included students as young as eight years old. We are in a pandemic which caused an economic crisis, which has created a mental health crisis. And getting children back into school buildings is a key way that we can ensure that they are getting the education and support that they desperately need and they deserve. That's why we must do everything we can to help prevent the spread. That's part of why I am putting Nevada in a three week statewide pause with restrictions I just spoke about. Restriction, the restrictions I outlined tonight apply statewide. They are baseline standards for all of our communities, but I would be remiss not to remind local governments of their ability to enact stronger measures, especially if your local public health officials are giving you recommendations or if your hospitals become overwhelmed or if you experience outbreaks in your counties, take action. The measures I'm announcing tonight, our statewide pause will be in effect for a three week period. Throughout this pause, we'll be evaluating our situation and looking for signs of concern or improvement. We will monitor our transmission rate, the slope of the epi curve and our percentage increase of cases. Depending on the trends, Nevadans can expect a few outcomes. If our percentage increase of cases begins to slow and our epi curve begins to plateau, we will make an evaluation of whether it's a consistent trend or whether we need more time under these restrictions to ensure that the downward trajectory stays in place. Or we may consider slowly loosening back to the restrictions currently in place. The numbers and the virus, as well as our individual and collective actions, determine the timeline. If this action is not taken seriously and our situation worsens in the next three weeks, continuing the current trajectory that threatens our healthcare infrastructure, I will be forced to intervene and to take even stronger actions. Stronger, stronger actions will be targeted at high risk settings and may include the prohibition of indoor dining and service at restaurants and bars, closure of gyms and fitness facilities, severe restrictions on gathering sizes. That is what our future holds if our trends do not improve. As your governor, I am confident that I did all I could to avoid further restrictions and keep us on the path forward. But now I must act. I am hopeful that these restrictions announced today going to effect on Tuesday will help reduce our caseload I don't want to impose further restrictions. We are too close to the real solution, the vaccines to give up now. I, remained I remain encouraged by developments with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. There is a light at the end of this tunnel and we are getting closer, but we do not have a vaccine yet. There's no doubt that this surge is a global and national problem, but it's our problem as Nevadans to fix what we can fix within our own state. So in this moment, with these new restrictions and with that optimism on vaccine programs in mind, I'm asking all of Nevada's leaders, business, labor, religious, elected, associations, academic, and many others, to intensify your efforts even more, to educate, inform, and model what is required of all of us to bridge the gap to the vaccine, to re fully reopen our lives and to propel Nevada forward once again. I implore you to tap into Nevada's independent spirit in this moment and consider your own personal responsibility. We decide our distance to others. We decide how long we spend in a high risk setting. We decide whether we're gonna prioritize getting our kids into the classroom allowing our business to operate by following responsible measures and protecting our hospital system. If it doesn't feel safe, it isn't safe. 
Be determined, offer help and hope to others. Believe in our future and know we are closer to the end than to the beginning of this terrible pandemic. Thank you. I appreciate your indulgence and I will now take some questions. I believe my staff is on the Zoom to facilitate this process. Thank you, Governor Sisolak, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so we do have um, some hand raised. This is Megan Delaney, Governor Sisolak's comms director. So I'll be calling on the folks with the hands raised. And then if you could, uh, I think you can unmute yourselves if you're on a computer using the button. If you're on a phone, you might need to dial star six. We'll go first to Vanessa Murphy. I see your hand raised, Vanessa Murphy, channel eight. Um, if you could uh, try to unmute yourself and then you can ask the governor your question. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, Governor Sisolak, how do you um, plan on enforcing, for example, limitations on uh, private gatherings and also this stronger mask mandate you're referring to? Well, we are certainly not the mask police, but I have done everything I could to help spread this virus. It's now incumbent upon all of us as residents of Nevada to do our part. I hope that people understand the science that we're dealing with, the medical and healthcare realities that we are dealing with, and that they will comply with the directives that are in place. Thank you for your question, Vanessa. We'll go next to Megan Messerly of the Nevada Independent. Hi, Governor. Thanks for doing this. Um, I know some businesses, especially some restaurants, have previously said that they just can't make ends meet at 25% capacity and are, are going to have to shut their doors. They just can't run a business uh, with the overhead. So why limit uh, those businesses to 25% capacity and, and not have them close completely? Well, a lot of these businesses, I think, can operate at 25%. And with the curbside delivery and with the takeout, uh, joined in there. It's our hope that with the pets money that we gave out recently, we're doing everything we can to help our small businesses. This is a three-week pause, and we're hopeful that uh, the community will support the businesses through other methods, be that delivery or takeout, but the capacity will be 25%. It's up to them to decide if they want to open at 25%. Thank you for the question. Um, I think I passed the host back over to Randy because I'm not good at the Zoom, but um, we'll do next question from Bill Denser of the RJ. Bill? Thanks, May. Hi, Governor. Uh, my question was about uh, whether in formulating these new restrictions, you spoke and engaged with the counties uh, and their health facility, their health uh, uh, organizations to coordinate uh, Again, this kind of goes to the enforcement question, how they will carry out uh, the mandates. I mean, did you have interaction? Did the state have interaction with the counties? And are they aware of what's coming? And are they supportive of it? Well, we did have interactions with all of our partners, be those the counties and the cities and the different jurisdictions through the COVID task force and other phone calls. It is my hope, and they always have the option to make stricter restrictions. Unfortunately, that has not happened to date, and the time has come that I had to take a stand. I had to implement strong restrictions. Washoe was breaking records on a daily basis. I have to do something. And that is the reason that this was done in consultation with all of the various groups, our health professionals, our business professionals, our uh, community partners. And I'm confident that this is the right thing to do for our state. Thank you, Governor. We'll go to um, Sam Metz of the AP next, please. Sam. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking my question, and so I'm glad you sound a little better. Are you glad you have the ability to implement such complex and pinpointed restrictions, or do you wish there were more uniform national standards for the pandemic? I, I, I certainly wish there was a more unified national standard. We could have been much better off from the beginning had we implemented uh, mask mandates and social distancing and those sort of things. Unfortunately, uh, the task force, the COVID task force and the administration did not choose that avenue and governors were left to deal with it on their own. And I talked to my uh, gubernatorial colleagues on a regular basis. Different states are handling it different ways. And Nevada is different than some states. We have basically in Southern Nevada, a one industry town. 
that we have to try to balance the benefits of opening up and protecting our health. And I'm confident that we made the right choice by limiting it in this manner. Thank you. We'll go to um, John Sadler of The Sun, please. Hi, Governor, can you hear me? I can, John. Hi, Governor, well, thanks for doing this. Um, I wanted to hop back to something you said um, in your remarks uh, when you were talking about the importance you know, of the economy in making these decisions. Why did you go with, with these, um, these restrictions rather than um, a shutdown of businesses um, like earlier in the pandemic? Well, early in the pandemic, we had a total shutdown, John, and uh, the effect on our economy was devastating and our unemployment hit an all-time high. I'm confident in discussion with the industry experts and with our health experts that if we operate under these protocols, we can safe, we can keep our employees, our residents, and our guests safe. I'm confident that working together, that's a reality. That's not a possibility. Uh, the spread is not... Uh, necessarily confined to hotels and casinos. It's the gatherings and the interaction, the group that creates the spread. So we've done everything we can to minimize that interaction, that social interaction, uh, to keep everybody as safe as possible. Thank you, Governor. Um, we'll do the next question with Madison McKay. Madison, please. <laughs> Hi, Governor Sislak. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, will you encourage or talk to county commissions and local governments to enact tighter restrictions that are more specifically targeted to those areas, for example, indoor dining in certain counties? Well, for months now, we have given the local jurisdictions that flexibility, that authority to institute tighter restrictions. Unfortunately, until now, they have not done that. And the time has come with the cases rising as quickly as they are, that something had to be done. So I stepped up and we're implementing these restrictions. If counties choose to go further, I support them in that decision. Uh, we will be in constant communication and contact with them and provide any support that's necessary. But ultimately, they will have the final jurisdiction in their area. They can make restrictions more restrictive but not less restrictive. And that'll be left up to them on an individual case by case, county by county basis. Thank you, Governor. We'll go to um, Howard Stutz for the next question. Howard, if you could um, try to unmute yourself and ask your Hey, Howard. There I am. How are you doing, Governor? Good. I hope Good. You're better. I um, am, thank you. How do you enforce the 25% limit on casinos, on the strip casinos, especially coming up with Thanksgiving holiday? And I, I'm not sure what the you know visitation numbers are yet for that, but how, how do you go about enforcing that? How I go about enforcing that is we are in uh, constant contact with our gaming control board and our new chair, uh, Bryn Gibson, who I'm extremely proud we have him there. I mean, Sandra was terrific and I know Bryn will do a great job. I had conversations with most of our gaming operators in the past 24 hours. I can assure you that the full force of the Nevada Gaming Control Board will be behind the implementation and the enforcement of these 25% requirements. And if they don't follow them, they will suffer the consequences as delineated by the Gaming Control Board. And Governor, the 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 restaurant requirement for reservations, that, that falls into the casinos themselves also, the restaurants there. They have to have, those guests have to make a reservation, no walk-ins on, on in those uh, restaurants, correct? That is absolutely correct. All restaurants will be required to have a reservation system in place and people will have to make a reservation in order to get a table. Thank you, Governor, hope you're feeling better. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you, Howard. Um, we'll go to the next question. Um, Fox 5 Las Vegas. I'm not sure who the reporter is on the line, but Fox 5. Hi, Governor. Um, so my question is, is theater prepared for another potential surge of applicants, say, if restaurants or bars decide to shut back down due to these restrictions? Well, I'm hopeful that they won't shut down. I'm hopeful that they'll be able to, you know, make it based on the 25% capacity. I know it's asking a lot of them. Uh, but I'm hopeful that the takeout and the delivery business will increase as a result, and it's a for a three-week period. I'm confident that if we get everybody complying and pitching in, that 
It'll be a short time. It'll be three years, but Dieter's aware of what the restrictions are in place and will handle anything that comes forward to the best of their ability. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for the question. We've got time for a couple more. We'll go to Bob Conrad from This Is Reno. Bob? Hi, right, thank you, Governor. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned getting kids back into school. The Washoe County School Board on Tuesday, I believe, is going to be voting to go to full distance learning. And I believe part of that, in, in addition to the increasing cases, is the um, uh, reduction in available resources, such as uh, staff and subs. Are you recommending that they not go to full distance learning? Well, my recommendation is that they consult with our superintendent, Joan Ebert, who's been working with all of the various superintendents. I can tell you this, Bob, that the cost mentally and emotionally of not getting these kids into a classroom and having in-person education at least part way is devastating. We need to get the kids in the classrooms and we can get them in the classrooms. If we can get everybody to pitch in, if you wanna get the kids back in the classroom, you want to get the teachers back in the classroom, classrooms. Help us out. Wear the mask, socially distance, limit the group size gatherings. Those are the kind of things we need to do to get our economy back going, to get our businesses back open, to protect our vulnerable, and to get our kids back in the classrooms where they need to be. It's been eight months since kids have been in a classroom. That's unacceptable for kids. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Governor. I think we'll take one um, last question from Andrew Davey, and then um, we'll be able to wrap it up here, Governor. Okay. Uh, yes. Hello, Governor. Um, to follow up on uh, some earlier questions, um, how do you feel the, um, the federal government's response thus far has helped or hampered um, your efforts and the efforts of uh, our local public health authorities to um, to contain COVID-19? Well, the lack of a national plan has been devastating to all of the states. And all of the governors have basically been left on their own to deal with this situation, to procure PPE, to come up with a policy, to come up with uh, restrictions as it relates to healthcare. Or if something as simple as the encouraging of wearing of a mask would have happened nationally months ago, we would be in a lot better position than we are right now. But we're not. I mean, the reality is we're not in that position. And I'm hopeful that uh, a new policy uh, will come forward in the distribution and the uh, use of the vaccinations, the vaccines that are beginning to be made available so that we can get them distributed in a fair manner to all of the states and to all of the people that need it in the most expeditious manner possible. And that needs to be done on a national basis. You cannot have every state fighting with every other state in order to try to procure these things. We need to have a national plan in place, and it's my hope that we do that. Great, thank you, Governor, if there are any- There is, and I wanna just add there, there is hope. These vaccines they're talking about, potentially some of them coming out next month and into the first quarter of next year. As I said in my remarks, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. We're closer to the end than we are to the beginning, and that's what should give us some hope. And this is the time that you need everybody to just reach down. And I know we've asked a lot and I'm asking more. This is the right thing to do. And I'm asking everybody to please participate. Do what's best for you and your families. Thank you, Governor. And we uh, actually will take one last question from Telemundo, if you don't mind, and then we can wrap it up for the evening. So Telemundo, if you could unmute yourself and you can ask the governor your question. You consider, yes. Governor Cecil, like, are you considering any kind of uh, penalty for those who doesn't follow this new mandate? Well, certainly there's going to be ramifications for those that don't. As Howard Stutz asked earlier with gaming, uh, with the gaming in the gaming venue, we have the Gaming Control Board that has pretty much uh, great latitude in determining what the penalties would be. I'm hopeful it won't come to that. I'm hopeful that people will do it. But local jurisdictions, business licensing, code enforcement, BNI, OSHA, all of the enforcement agencies are going to be made available and they're going to be out enforcing these new restrictions. But it shouldn't be that somebody has to come in and enforce them. It should be that people understand we want to protect our businesses. 
We want to protect our vulnerable and we want to get kids back in classrooms. And if we work together, we can make all of that happening by everybody doing their part. Thank you very much, Governor Tizola. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. We'll have um, a press release out to media after this is over and I'll be able to take any additional questions um, that folks, if they weren't able to join the Zoom, will be able to take those um, via email. So thank you very much, Governor, if you have any closing remarks before we end the Zoom. No, I wanna thank everybody first off for their outpouring of concern about my health. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm very thankful that my symptoms were minor. And again, I wanna thank and congratulate the incredible frontline healthcare workers that we have here in the state of Nevada and those that, that took care of me. And, and I appreciate that. But this disease is nothing to mess around with. You can take all the precautions and still be infected. It is extremely contagious, but we're, we're not at its mercy. We can do so much if we just all work together and everybody does their little part. I understand that people are gonna get together, but shorten your group uh, public gatherings if that's what you have and try to protect yourself as much as possible and thus protect your families and your loved ones. So with that, thank you all very much and God bless. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, everyone. Well, there you have it. Um, for those of you who are just tuning in and maybe you turned in a little late and you're like, oh my God, what just happened? Well, the governor just addressed uh, the state of Nevada and he said, hey, I'm not shutting you down, but there are some new restrictions. If you're tuning in late and you're wondering what the new restrictions are, I will go over those. These new restrictions do go into effect at 12.01 a.m. on Tuesday. 12.01 a.m. on Tuesday and shall last for three weeks. So that means all the way until December 15th. He now says that the mask mandate means you must wear your mask at all times indoors and outdoors at all times. Okay, uh, so basically the mask has to be on 24 seven in his opinion. He says, hey, I'm not closing down any businesses, but I am going to really affect capacity. Let's go over that really quickly. 25% capacity at restaurants and bars, no more than four patrons. The only thing he said that I agree with 110% in that entire time was that restaurants must now accept reservations. Thank you. Why do some restaurants say, no, we won't accept any reservations. You've just got to come and wait. That's so stupid. Everybody should accept reservations. So uh, I like that. But there's no more walk-ins. So if you want to go to someplace for breakfast, you want to go to someplace for lunch, someplace for dinner, you do need to make a reservation now. That does kind of suck. Uh, gyms, fitness centers, dance studios, et cetera, et cetera. They are now going back down to 25% capacity. Museums, libraries, zoos, aquariums, gaming centers, uh, uh, arcades, 25% capacity. Churches, 25% capacity of fire code or 50 people or less. This is also for theaters, for funerals, for casinos. Um, he said, if we don't listen to him, that in three weeks, he's going to close down even more. And uh, that will not mean closing down the casinos. He said it. It will mean closing down um, restaurants and gyms and small businesses. All right, let's get to the questions, because those of you who stick around for the reporter questions, you're the smart cookies, because it reveals a whole heck of a lot. Because, oh, I forgot my favorite part private gatherings in your home. You have to wear a mask now. Yes, yes. And you can only have at max two households in your home at one time. <laughs> Oops, Thanksgiving. Um, and it has to be less than 10 people. <laughs> Oops, Thanksgiving. Um, so this is super convenient that this goes into effect on Tuesday, two days before Thanksgiving. And yes, you're supposed to wear your mask with your family. Ah. <sighs> This is why I laugh because the very, 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 sorry, that's my dog. My very, 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 very first question from Channel 8 was this, um, Dinah, how do you plan to enforce whether people are wearing masks at private gatherings in people's homes? Well, he goes, this is his answer. This is his answer. Well, we're not the mask police. Oh, you're not the mask police? Of course you're not the mask police because you can't enforce that. That is unconstitutional. That is against the law. He's not the mask police. He can't prevent you from, he can't, he cannot come into your home and say, is everybody here wearing a mask? Hey, you're having Thanksgiving dinner. Are there three families here? 
bazinga, you're going to get a penalty. I love it because at the very end, at the very end, the Telemundo reporter chimes in and goes, um, is there going to be any penalties for any of this? And he starts rambling about how, well, you know, gaming control, gaming control is going to look and see what those casinos are doing. And, you know, there's code enforcement and there's OSHA. Oh, bam, right there. There is no freaking penalty if you're a private citizen in your own private home. He can't tell you what to do in your home. Bam, right there, right there. He admitted it. In fact, he admitted a lot at the very end, if you were listening. He said... You can take all the precautions and you can still get it. What? You can take all the precautions. You can wear a mask. You can hide out in your home. You can always get your groceries delivered. You could do all that and you could still get COVID. <gasps> You're kidding me. Really? Yes. He was the most truthful and the very freaking end of the press conference when he said, yeah, you could take all these precautions and still get it. You cannot stop COVID from happening. You cannot stop COVID from happening. He admitted it right then and there. Now, one reporter, God help her. I'm not outing her here. That's kind of rude. But she goes, oh, Governor Sislak, I don't understand why you just didn't shut everybody down. He basically said, well, I can't do that because of the economy. And it's kind of up to the restaurants themselves that they're going to shut themselves down. <gasps> whoa, 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 whoa. See, I just get my mind gets blown. When I hear these questions because there's these moments where you see that Sislak fully understands that he can't do any of this. He can't shut everybody down. He can't force businesses, whether they're open or not. He cannot screw people over this way. He does not have the constitutional power to do so. And he's also not going to do it because he said, hey, we can't hurt our economy. And here's the big breaking news. Shutdowns don't work. Shutdowns don't work. They do not stop the spread. There is no scientific evidence that everybody just hanging out in their home means no one's going to get COVID. There's no proof of it. No proof of it. There is proof that wearing a mask will slow the spread. There is proof that social distancing helps. There is proof that washing your hands helps. But just as Sister Lack said in the very, very end, you could take all those precautions and you could still get it. You could still get it. He got it. Remember that? Remember that? Um, what we're seeing right now is you're seeing a bunch of politicians who want control. They want control. They want to be able to control the situation. They need to be able to tell uh, all of their constituents and in their election mail to come in 2022, they need to be able to say, I did all I could. Look at all I did. Look at my list right here of everything that I did. This is what I did to protect you. This is what I did for public health. This is what I did right here. And that is why he's doing this. He is doing this for perception, to look like he's in control, to look like he's doing something. But at the end of the day, you can do everything in your power to look like you're in control. You can put your hands on your hips. You can have a really stern look. You can say, if you don't listen to me, it's gonna get really, really bad. And you can act like you're big and bad and in control, but you cannot control a virus. It's just can't be done. You can't put it up in a little box. You can't lock it up. You can't throw it away. We're going to be living with COVID for a long time. We've actually been living with COVID for a really long time because it is a form of SARS and it is a form of the coronavirus. And many of you realize that SARS really came onto the scene back in 2002. I get it's a different strain. This is the strain that we saw in uh, the year 2019. But let's be real honest here. This isn't like some new thing that we've never seen before. It's a crazy strain, but it ain't something new. It's not like, dang, where'd this virus come from? None of us have heard it before. No, we've all heard of it before. This is literally him just, you know, trying to uh, 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 let me let me let me show my strength here. Let me show how how tough, how tough I'm gonna do. Other comments he made, other comments he made. He said, You really need to do what's best for you and your family. See, he has these moments, he has these moments where he starts talking like he's an actual, like, I don't know, human being who's a Republican. Yes, it's up to you and your family what is best for you, not 
freaking Governor Sisolak, not any politician, not any politician. If you believe in freedom, you do not need some elitist in their white tower telling you how to live and telling you what to do. And you certainly do not need people shaming you because you want to do what's best for you and your family, telling you that you're doing something wrong. That is the most atrocious thing at all. Because whenever we go after safety, and in the name of safety, we say that we need to get rid of freedom. You are screwing yourselves. I want to remind everyone right now, let's go back to 2001. Let's go back to 9-11. It happened. And what did we do? All of a sudden, we as human beings got very, very scared that there might be terrorists on planes and that they might try to kill us. So you know what we're going to do? Uh, we're going to have to take off our shoes because there could be some, you know, I don't know, explosive device in the shoe. Um, um, we're going to have to give up all our privacy. I mean, they should definitely, the government, government should definitely be listening to our private phone calls because you know what there might be a clue in there somehow we just gave up privacy right privacy right after privacy right over and over and over again after 9 11 because we were afraid of terrorism and here we are 20 years later going god why'd we give up all this privacy i don't understand why people are so eager to give up their freedom in the name of safety I should actually rephrase that. I don't know why people are so eager to give up their freedom because they're afraid. Remember the old saying, there's nothing to fear but fear itself? It's 110% true. If you're afraid, that's on you. And no one can take away that fear but you. If you're really afraid of coronavirus, then please stay home. If you're really afraid of coronavirus, get your groceries delivered. If you're really afraid of coronavirus, then don't go to restaurants. If you're really afraid of coronavirus, then don't send your kids to school. But if you're not afraid, then don't live in fear. If you're not afraid, then don't be controlled. My friends, those of you who are those out there who are shaming you, who are saying that this is about public health and we have to do what we need to. And I'm willing to give up my freedom because this is about public health and this is about public safety. Those who are shaming you, just ignore them and walk away. Because those are the people who one day, when all of their rights and freedoms are taken away, they're gonna sit there and go, dang, how did this happen? Dang, how did this happen? Dang, how did this happen? And you're gonna be the smart one who's gonna say, I know exactly how this happened. You weren't smart enough to wake up then. Right now, the media is truly controlling the narrative. And I'm not just talking about the news. I'm freaking talking about even the TV that people watch. Have you seen Grey's Anatomy lately or any of those medical shows? They're all opening their episodes about how we're dealing with COVID and everybody's dying. And this is the weirdest thing ever. Blah, 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 blah. You're being conditioned to be afraid of this. You are being conditioned to be told that this is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. You are being conditioned to say you need to stay home and not go out. You are being conditioned to say, you know what, the government needs to take care of me. You are being conditioned to say, I can't go to work. I need to stay home and you government, you need to take care of me. And my friends, that's the problem because that is opening the door to a socialist society. That is opening the door for the government taking care of you. Now, let me ask you this. Do you want the government to take care of you? Do you want the government to decide what kind of home you have? Do you want the government to decide what kind of job you're going to do? Do you want the government to decide what your kids are going to be when they grow up? Do you want the government to decide what you can wear? Do you want the government to decide, you know, how you should look? Hmm. Do you want the government to decide um, how many children you should have? I mean, we're in the midst of a pandemic. Maybe you shouldn't be having children at all, right? So maybe the government should come in and say, until we get this pandemic under control, no more pregnancy, right? You're looking at me and you're being like, if there's a liberal watching right now, they're saying, oh, Michelle, you're so stupid. Nobody would ever say that. Well, why would nobody ever say that? I mean, we're basically saying we want to give up our freedom all the time because we have to. It's a public service. We have to do it for public safety. The reason I mock and I do the voices and I get really mad is because I need everyone to wake up. And those who already woke who realize that this is coming for your personal freedoms and your rights, I need you to speak louder. I need you to speak longer. And if you're not comfortable speaking, then I need you to share this. Then I need you to share this. And this is why we need more people to realize their freedoms are being taken away before their very eyes. And our freedoms are not being taken away by everyday citizens like you and me. No, our freedoms are being taken away by elitists. Elitists who do not believe that any of these rules apply to them. Elitists who believe the law is for the little people to obey. 
today. But people like us, me and my, and my cronies, because I'm a politician, oh, 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 those rules don't apply to me. If you're okay with that, then I guess you can turn this off. But if you're not okay with that, then you need to get more people to be awake to what's really going on here. Because we have truly entered a stage where you can't, you little people can't go to a restaurant, but I'm Gavin Newsom. I can. You little people over here, you can't get on a plane and go visit your grandmother for Thanksgiving. God, no. God, no. But I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C., and I can travel to Delaware and go say hi to Joe Biden because, well, I'm a politician and that's my job. <laughs> this is what's happening to you. This is what's happening. Those in their ivory white towers are creating these rules that they fully admit are not enforceable, that they fully admit cannot be enforced. And they're saying, you better believe us, because if you don't, I'm going to come down harder. That's kind of like a dad scolding a child, right? You know, your kid keeps getting gum and spitting gum on the on the cement outside in the, on the driveway and you keep running over it with your car and you're like, oh, I hate this. I hate this kid. You can't do this anymore. You can't do this anymore. And you keep saying like, oh, if you do that again, if you do that again, you're going to be grounded. And then the kid does it again. And dad just goes, oh, if you do it again, you're going to be grounded. The kid does it again and he goes, oh, if you do it again, you're going to be grounded. And let's be very real. He didn't do anything this time either. He came and talked to us on October 20th, October 29th, on November 10th. And now here we are. What day is it today? November 22nd. Yeah, he does it about every 10 days. He comes out and says, if you don't listen to me, it's going to get a whole heck of a lot worse. Well, all he did was reduce capacity and tell you to wear a mask at your home, which cannot be enforceable. And he even admitted that. And there is no penalty for you. For those of you who are going to have Thanksgiving and there's going to be more than one household there, guess what? The mask police are not going to show up at your house. You're not going to have to wear a scarlet letter or a golden star or anything else to show that you were just a mask violator and you ain't going to jail and there ain't going to be any fine. Now, if you're a business owner, I would truly uh, uh, abide by his recommendations because if you're a business owner, this is where he can screw you. Because they can revoke your business license. They can find the heck out of you. They can make it really, really tough. And that's the, that's the core of it. He knows very well he cannot do anything to you personally in your home, but he can screw over businesses. And he basically gave us the warning. If this does not, if we don't get control of this virus. I'm coming after you and I'm closing down the restaurants for good. And I'm closing down all of the gyms. Here's the problem, closing to 25% capacity, limiting the number of people in church, it isn't going to change what's going on right now. It, it can't, this is a virus. And even if our numbers go down, numbers elsewhere won't. Now I get the concern, as we pointed out on this very show, um, Hospital capacities are very, very high. They're not high with COVID. They're just high overall. They could be high with the many, many, many people trying to commit suicide, particularly our young people, because there is no school. They could be high because of just the regular old flu. They could be high because of elected surgeries. They could be high because of surgeries that have been delayed. Hospitalization overall since the 1980s has been very high in the months of November, December, and January, and near capacity for years, yes, since the 1980s, for as long as they have been posting, um, keeping records of this, we have had a problem with hospitalization capacity for decades now, particularly in the winter months, because that's when more and more people get sick. It is concerning to have your hospitals at that high of a capacity. I do want to remind everyone, though, many people who worked in hospitals are still furloughed because the hospitals have had to cut back due to all the cutbacks. We desperately need more hospitals. And here in the state of Nevada, we desperately need better medical care. God, we've been saying that for years. And none of your elected officials, Republican or Democrats, that's right, all those career politicians who you've been voting for over and over and over and over and over again, not one of them has done a dang thing to improve health care in the state of Nevada. Not a one has done a dang thing to improve education here in the state of Nevada. Not a one. 
And those are connected, healthcare and education, because you have to have the higher ed to get the medical schools here to improve the healthcare. And you've got to have doctors who want to be here so they can have their kids go to good schools. But when you got the crappiest schools in the nation, no one wants to come and live here. Yeah. A bunch of Californians are coming here now because they're buying cheap homes and they're like, I can telecommute anyway. It's fine. But that is not the solution, my friends. Vegas is in a big problem. And we've been in this big problem for a really long time, for 20 years plus. We put all of our eggs in one basket. It's called tourism. And it doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if it's 9-11. It doesn't matter if it's the Great Recession. It doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's the October shooting. It doesn't matter if it's the pandemic. When you put all your bay eggs in one basket, the tourism basket, when tourism gets taken away, guess what happens? Your economy dries up. For decades now, we have been needing to change things here in the state of Nevada by diversifying, by improving education, and by pr improving our health care. And our elected leaders refuse to do so. Now, many of you who are watching this were also asking questions like, why aren't any of these reporters asking important questions? Like, what the fudge are people going to do if he's reducing capacities? That means more people are going to lose their jobs right before the holidays, which totally sucks. And how is Dieter going to be able to handle that? Now, that's a really great question because I don't know if you're aware of this, but Dieter has been sending out letters, letters, government letters to people saying, guess what? You owe us like $10,000. Guess what? You owe us $5,000 for all that unemployment you got. Yet they haven't gotten one unemployment check. What the fudge is up with that, right? What the fudge is up with that? Dieter is a very broken system. And Barbara Buckley, who claims to be the consumer advocate for the state of Nevada, who claims to be the one who's like, I started the Alila Center for Help. I mean, I'm just the best thing ever since sliced bread. Just tells people, don't you worry about that. We'll get you on a payment plan. There ain't no payment plan. When you haven't been paid out, you sure as shooting aren't going to pay a bill for $10,000. This is ridiculousness. Dieter is falling apart. Dieter has been falling apart for years. We are in massive unemployment. He just made it even worse and the government has no way to respond. And if you're a conservative and you're saying, you know what, that totally sucks and someone needs to be held accountable for that, you're totally right. But if you're a liberal snowflake, you're saying this is about public health and none of that matters. No, it does freaking matter. It matters a whole heck of a lot. We need to wake up. We cannot continue on this path and we cannot allow these politicians to keep us on this path. Everyone you just elected, everyone you just elected, whether they're an R or a D, you better hold them accountable. Because no one does. And they rarely ever change things. All your new assemblymen, all your new um, senators, they're all going to be revealing what bills they're going to try to get passed here in the next in the next session, here in the next couple of days. If I'm not seeing bills for data reform, if I'm not seeing bills to make big budget cuts so that we can stay afloat, then I'm not going to be very happy and you shouldn't either. A lot of you are asking, sorry, when I get going, I don't really read the comments. I'm going to try to read the comments here. A lot of you are asking, what can you do? What can you do? What can you do? Y'all, we need to educate the public. So whether you speak out or whether I speak out and you just constantly share the message so it gets out there, we need people to wake up. We need people to be informed. We need people to know, I'm not, you. these are not my words. These are the governor's words. Well, we can't enforce it, enforce it. You can take all precautions and you can still get COVID. You have to do what's best for you and your family. That's the heart of the issue right there. That's the heart of the issue. And I guess the second thing that you can do is you can make sure that we get Governor Sisolak out. I do believe it's Mark Hutchinson who's going to be running against him in 2022. Um, of course, no one has announced. So that could, of course, change. And you could he doesn't announce. And then you'll go and be like, Michelle, you're a liar. He didn't do it. Hey, I'm just telling you what the, you know, the rumor mill is, is reporting. But no matter what, we're going to have a Republican who's running against this lack. And, and I don't care if he's the worst Republican on the planet or the best Republican planet or the person running she, he, she, whoever it is. I don't care who it is. I don't care. I don't care who it is. It could be someone I despise with every ounce of my being. And y'all know I despise some Republicans. Um, it could be someone I despise. And I would still say you'd have to support them because Sisolak needs to go. How do we get Sisolak to go? You've got to start money. 
money. There ain't no recall in the world that's going to work. So if you say recall, I'm just going to shut you down and say you're wrong because we can't get enough signatures. We've tried it many times. It will not happen. The recall is not the way to go. The way to do this is with money, cash, 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 cash. Because we will need to flood a Republican candidate with all the cash in the world so that they can win this election and they can destroy Sisolak in the polls in November 2022. That's only two years away. Not even really. Well, it's two years away. Two years away. That's our option. That's our option. And our second option. So we've got to raise money. We've got to vote him out. And if you're a praying person, I say you, you got to pray. Because here's the interesting thing. If you are a person of faith, you know, I'm a person of faith. And I know when I start talking about faith, the faith people get excited and the non-faith people, say they just turn out. But if you're a person of faith, you know that even as hard as 2020 has been, even, even as awful as 2020 has been, you've been blessed and you have a lot to be thankful for. Because even in the dark times, you know how to consider it all joy. So don't lose your joy. I get wild and, and yell and blah, blah, blah. It, because these things get me riled up and I get angry. But don't ex don't miss don't mistake my anger and the yelling and the raising of my boys that I don't have joy. Because here's what I know: the best is yet to come. I know that even as awful as this year has been, and this has been a pretty dang awful year for me, it's been a great year because God is still on the throne. And he is directing and ordering my steps. And any day with him is better than any second without. That was a little preachy. I apologize. So that's the crux of it. You can bet your bottom dollar, folks. We're going to be talking about this ad nauseum tomorrow morning on the Michelle Mortensen show. Ad nauseum. We're going to be talking about it nonstop. In that time, I'm going to come up with more ideas of ways that we can fight back and what we need to do. I would say... Uh, Donate, 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 donate to PACs like Building a Better Nevada. Donate directly uh, to PACs because PACs are really the people you can donate to right now or people who are going to be up for re-election again. Uh, if you want to send some money over to people like Senator Kerry Buck, uh, Senator Keith Pickard, people like that, totally do it because the more money that they have, the more money we can give to quality Republican candidates. Those are all great things that you can do. And I'm going to come up with more things um, for us to do. Quickly, if you have a question that you want me to answer really quickly, start putting that in the comments right now and I will look at it. Uh, I will look at it and try to answer those as quickly as possible. But we are uh, going to have this on the show tomorrow. So tune in right here on Facebook or YouTube, 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Kaya Jones is going to be with us tomorrow as well. We're going to be talking about this. And we're going to be talking about probably my one of my least favorite governors. I have, a, I have like four or five I really can't stand. And one that I can't stand is, is Cuomo. And uh, I'm going to be talking some Cuomo tomorrow too. Um, so that is tomorrow's show. You can also tune in on KSHP 1400 AM. Okay, Teresa wants me to explain why the recall doesn't work. So remember a couple of years ago, uh, there was a recall effort to get rid of Joyce Woodhouse, um, Patty Farley, I believe, and uh, Nicole Cannizzaro. Well, that didn't work. It kind of failed, right? And so the Democrats then, and because they were in total control of the legislature, they passed a law that made it that you needed so many signatures for a recall to work that they were impossible. It was impossible to get the number of signatures needed. That's why none of the recalls you have seen in the past couple of years have done anything because the signature request is too massive. So while they did work in many years past, now they're not because you need to get so many signatures and you need to do it in an even shorter period of time. So they've really taken recalls off the table. That's why it won't work. So there's no mathematical way we can get it done. They've already tried three recalls, three recalls for Sisolak. Not a one has worked. Not a one has worked. Not a one has worked. Um, Sonny's asking, where do I find his new restrictions in writing? So um, at uh, the NevadaHealth.gov website in probably an hour or so, they will release the full press release of what the issues are. I will try to remember to, to post that here as well. Um, Raj says, I would like to see an outsider. Are there any? 
Ah, that, Raj, that's a freaking great question. And I love that you asked that. Uh, it's very hard for outsiders to win elections. Why? Well, because in the state of Nevada, we have a primary system. We have a closed primary system. And in our primaries, not a lot of people vote except for the elitists in that party. Um, so those are the people who go to, for example, if you're a Republican, those are people who go to like Clark County Republican meetings, 200 something people. Those people control who gets elected and they always choose the wrong people. Outsiders don't get in because whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, let's just be honest, politics is politics and they want the same old players. They want the same good old boys network. There's a lot of cronyism that goes on in politics in the right and the left. So just because you're a conservative or a Republican doesn't mean that like you're above all that. No, no, it's totally there. And they don't like outsiders. They all want it to be insiders. I mean, take a look at who's won. I mean, Andy Matthews won in District 37. Very happy about that. But he's a total insider. He works deeply with Adam Laxalt. Uh, we don't let outsiders in. And so if you want to change that, you're going to have to start funding the outsiders. I know y'all get mad when I say this is all about money, but it is freaking all about money. So that is what politics comes down to. Um, can Trump arrest him for treason? Kristen asks. asks uh, no, no, um, I'm afraid not. Uh, that is because even though, Cis let me explain that. That's actually a good point. So even though Sisolax orders are unconstitutional based on the US Constitution. The way the laws in Nevada were written, I believe it's NRS 417 something. Um, I could be wrong on the number. But it basically says that when the governor wants to declare an emergency, the governor has full and total power and there is no one, not the legislature, no one who can argue with him. It actually gives under emergency orders. It actually gives uh, the governor the right to take your property if he sees fit and needs to. He has total, total control. And the governor issued an emergency order for as long as he sees fit and that he's the only one who can say the emergency order is over. So that's why there's literally nothing we can do because the laws that our legislators passed, I believe this law was passed in the 60s and has never been dealt with since then, gives the governor all power in the state of an emergency. Now let's talk about what an emergency is. An emergency is supposed to be, let's say there's a raging fire on Mount Charleston and it's coming down the mountain and it's coming down to Vegas and we need to get this debt. We need to, we need to stop this fire, right? It's a wildfire. There's winds everywhere. It's raging. We need to stop it. Well, he might say, I'm taking over, you know, this little convention area over here. I'm taking over this theater so that firefighters can be there and help fight the fire. Everyone's totally okay with that, right? Because there's a fire coming down the mountain and our homes are all going to be destroyed. It is literally for emergencies that have a very short window. Well, this emergency has now lasted nine months and heck, could go on for a year. And no one can take away Governor Sisolak's executive order to rule by emergency powers except Governor Sisolak. Now, some of you are asking, well, Michelle, I mean, I'm sure once we get Republicans in power, they'll get rid of that. No, no, we won't. I'll tell you why. Politicians love power. And no governor is going to sign a law that's going to take away his ability to have total and complete control. There you go. Any other questions? Uh, I don't know what even over eminent domain means in regards to what. Okay, Sherry says, is it true that Sicily is buddies with Newsom and Pelosi? Well, I'm sure they're all buddies and friends, kind of, but I, I don't know that that is necessarily uh, related. They're just, <sighs> my theory, again, this is not proven, my theory, uh, they're really hoping the Biden administration will give them a bunch of money in a bailout, that Pelosi and the Biden administration and Schumer are going to work out a plan to really uh, pay all these states back. And so they're doing the shutdown. So they say, yep, we do need a trillion dollars. And they think that Biden's going to like roll on up and be Oprah and be like, you get a trillion dollars, you get a trillion dollars, you get a trillion dollars. Um, I, I don't I don't think that's happening. Um, wait, so could he do a state emergency and keep us from traveling out or in Nevada? Tasha, he could do that. He hasn't done that and he's not going to do that. Do you want to know why? Same reason why he won't close down casinos, even if in the next round he wants further restrictions. He's not going to close down casinos because he needs 
those tourists to come here because our economy is really, really hurting. And starting in the beginning of February, the legislative session opens up and they're going to have to come up with budgets for the next two years and they don't have any money. And so he is not going to go after retail and he is not going to go after the casinos. He admits it every single freaking time he speaks because he cannot hurt us with the shutdown. Um, so is there any other questions? Gosh, you guys got a lot of questions, but I totally. Uh, so, oh, so Patrick, Matt, even with uh, him taking people's homes and properties with imminent domain. So again, Patrick, that goes back to that emergency situation. In an emergency situation, the governor does have the right to take property. Um, again, I believe there's like a 30 day or something window over that, but he has the right to do it. So there, it's, it's not about intimate oath donating. Remember this law that's on Nevada's books kind of trumps everything else. So what the governor says, the governor gets. Um, Stacy said, thanks for answering that. Yeah, no problem. All right. I don't really see any additional questions and I don't want to keep you on here. Okay. Kristen says, so basically we are stuck with him until election time and hopefully someone... <laughs> Hopefully someone with balls gets elected. Um, I, I, that's true. Um, but most people with balls don't get elected. <laughs> um, and most people who you think have balls are really just pretending they have balls, but, but they don't because they all bow to someone and they bow to whomever their special interest is or whoever's lining their pockets. That's the nasty, dirty truth about politics. Listen, I spent two years of my uh, three years of my life pursuing politics and I saw how it works from the inside. And part of the reason I'm doing this show is I think I need to pull back the curtain so that you can see what really goes on behind the scenes, too. And I know there's some people because when I say that, you're thinking like, well, not this person. I know this politician has total balls. I know it. No, they don't. No, they don't. Because the minute that their special interest group or the minute that someone who's giving them cash gets pissed at them, they cower as quickly as they can cower. Because here's the problem with politicians overall. They love the money and they love the power. And when you threaten to take one of those away, they say, what do I need to do to get it back? Because there is nothing more desirable than money, power, and sex. You know it. I know it. We all know it. Um, I don't know what this Barbara is, what she's saying that makes all of you so mad. But Barbara, thanks for playing because you've got everyone upset. Kat said, why don't you run? You know what? I may run again, but I've run twice now and I have been destroyed by the establishment male type. And uh, you know what? You need a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of money uh, to do so. And so right now what I'm doing is I'm using my voice, my 18 years of TV news experience, uh, the amazing uh, network that I have of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Nevadans who choose to tune in and listen to me and to really get the, the message out there. Uh, one of the things I always said when I was running for office is that if you can't communicate. And if you don't have an audience, why the heck are you running? And most of the people who run are horrible communicators who no one listens to. Well, guess what? I may not have won the elections, but you can't shut me up and you can't stop me. And you may think by losing, you stop me. Oh no. Oh no. You just made this mouth even more powerful. And uh, that's what we're doing here. That's exactly what we're doing here. And to those of you who say, uh, you know, I vote for more women than men and I vote for you. Thank you. I hope if and when the time comes again, I will have your vote and I will have your support. But right now we have a much bigger battle than getting me elected. Uh, we have a bigger battle of getting the truth out there with transparency and educating people. And right now that's my main and, and total, total goal. OK, last couple of questions here because there's so many. Um, Run, listen to Rush Limbaugh and you'll win. Well, Kevin, I, I've run twice now and I just lost most recently in 2020. So it's not necessarily true. And you do need a lot of cash, a lot of, lot of, lot of cash. But uh, your support means everything. And I do appreciate that so much. I appreciate all of you. And I, uh, I just encourage you to please just support the show, support what we're doing here. Please tune in tomorrow on Monday, 11 a.m. You can watch right here on Facebook. You can watch on YouTube. You can watch on Twitter. You can also listen at KSHP 1400 a.m. Or you can download the podcast. Let's say you're somebody who's lucky enough that you are working and you're like, Michelle, I can't get on a Facebook. Download the podcast. Listen to it in your car. You can get it at, I think, seven podcasting platforms. Spotify, Apple, Google, everywhere you want to go. Um, all right. <sighs> 
Kat says, you would have my vote in everyone that watches you. Kat, thank you. Thank you. One day we might get that opportunity. Um, right now, let's just really uh, give them hell right here, right now. And let's win. So uh, tune in tomorrow. Please support the show. If you're not supporting the show, michellemortensen.com, please consider it a monthly donation, no matter what the, the amount keeps this show on the air, keeps us with all the equipment and everything we know to uh, to get the show out there. It is it is it is so important. So um, at the end of the day, I'll leave you with that. Please donate michellemortensen.com. Go there today and donate. Support the show. Support us getting the truth out there. Support live news updates like this on freaking Sunday at 551 in the evening. You know, who does that at the end of the day? Um, and Peter, you are supporting me and you are a rock star. And I hope you got the email with all the great stuff from that great interview interview with Dr. Sal over the on Friday's episode, et cetera, et cetera. All right, everybody. Uh, sorry to keep you here this late on a Sunday. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter Collins. Where did she say we could find it again? <laughs> Okay. You can find everything on my website, actually at michellemortensen.com. You can watch past episodes. You can download the podcast there. But uh, if you get uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor Podcasts, Spotify, we're on seven different platforms. Just go ahead and uh, look for the Michelle Mortensen show there and you can download it and it's all good. All right. Um, on that note, uh, have a great Sunday, rest of your Sunday. I'll see you in the morning. I'll look a lot better. I won't have the fun pads under my eyes. And until then, um, have a great, great weekend. And, and don't worry, I'm not going to report on you if you have Thanksgiving and you don't wear a mask. No problem. No problem. I'm not telling. All right. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.